Hello everyone, hello everyone, welcome, welcome. Uh, come on in, let's do a quick tech check as you come on in. Let me know if you can hear me. Also, when you come in, let me know where you're from. Where are you in the world? And how long have you been playing? Um... Come on in the room. All right. Hello, T. Harris. How are you? Clinton McIntosh, Wichita, five years. Cool, too. Elijah. Hey, Elijah. Andreas from Houston, Texas. Hello, Andreas. Saint, uh, so it was Bolagon from St. Vincent, been playing for 15 years. Wow. All right, we have from Chennai, India, India, Chennai, India, India, Emmanuel. Wow. David, Jamaica, two years. Cool. Danita Patterson, Mobile, Alabama. Wow. Corey Lastra, Argentina, one year. Wow. Buji in Taka, Moscow. What what time is it in Moscow right now? Wow. Edwin Edwin's been playing eight months. Wow, you're a newbie. Wow. All right. Cedric Farmers from Baltimore. Playing for over 30 years. Wow. Cedric, you might know my cousins. I have two cousins. Um, and they're the ones that got me started playing. Um, the names are Mike McCoy and Marvin McCoy. They're the ones that really got me started playing in church. And they're in Baltimore, D.C. area, the DMV area. All right. Uh, let's see. Andre Brady from Jamaica. Cool deal. Mohau. I think I pronounced that right. Mohau from South Africa. Wait, it's five thirty. Five thirty in the morning or five thirty in 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 the evening, in afternoon. Clifton Ford from East Texas. East Texas. All right. Forty years. Woo. Wow. Oh, wow. Well, thanks for being here. Wow, you too, Elijah. I, I see you. Wow, man, you're 17 years. Cool deal. Fred, 20 years. Wow. Nate, from Jamaica. Good to see you. Herbert from Malaysia. Wow. All right, everybody coming in. I'll give you a few more moments. And then we'll get started. All right, Sarim, am I pronouncing that? A Sarami um, from South Africa. It's 4:35. Wow, unbelievable. All right, what's what's going on, Boston? Uh, 14 months. Wow, you're still a newbie as well. All right, come on in. We'll give everybody just a couple more moments, and then we're going to get started with this lesson. I have an exciting lesson planned for you all today. That's kind of going to piggyback on what we talked about last week. All right. Nate, eight for eight years. Okay, cool deal. <laughs> Tshepo, Christopher, South Africa. Wow, three years, four, three, four. I, I appreciate you all getting up this early to be on this um, live stream. I hope you don't have to work in the morning, <laughs> but I, I'm certainly appreciative that you took the time to come on. I'm honored. All right, so you all make sure you share this. Let all your friends know we want to get as many people on here as possible.
All right. Also, let me know some of the ideas, some of the things you want, want to see me cover. Go ahead and write that in the comment section as well. What are some ideas you want to hear me cover that you're burning to know? Like, what is it that you really, really want to know um, that you've been, that you haven't found the answer yet? What's going on, Bayes Thomas? Okay, Ricardo Lima, drop two movements. I actually addressed a little bit of drop two stuff in my 20 piano hacks video. I believe I did, 20 piano hacks. Um, I think it was in part one. Um, so definitely check that out, but I will be um, doing something. I, got to, I, I have something really big in store for you all um, regarding drop two, so stay tuned for that. That's it's gonna blow your mind, I promise you. <laughs> I kind of want to spill the beans now, but I'm, uh, I don't want to uh, give it away. All right, Bay says, headed to Bob's, I need a quick lick or two. Oh, you must be on the uh, West Coast then. All right. But Logan says, how to play arpeggio of your chords when transitioning. All right. Elijah training your ear. Late improvisation, knowing how to finger the scales. It's okay. There, all right. All right. Well, listen. Let's get started. Um, thank you for suggestions. I will be. Um, I have some things in store for you all. You all are naming stuff that I have. Some. Um, you all are naming concepts and ideas that I have. Materials coming out specifically for that idea. So just stay tuned. Stick with me. And um, I will be addressing all of you, all, at least everything so far that I've seen in the um, chat uh, um, really soon. Okay, so today we want to kind of piggyback on what we did last week. So last week we talked about these seven different levels of gospel harmony. Um, and... Uh, uh, like th we've had a really good response to the video. We had a, a, a an amazing response to the video, um, and so thank y'all for being a part of that. Uh, but I, I want to give you some tools, some tangible things you can you can use to help you get from one level to the next level. And this idea uh, is something that I've done, but I actually was inspired by Bill Belichick. Um, um, so if, if you're American or, or into, if you're into American football, then you know who Bill Belichick is. Um, Bill Belichick is the coach for the New England Patriots, one of the most winningest franchises in football. Um, they've won quite a number of championships over the last 15 years. Um, they've had a tremendous reign. Um, Bill Belichick is, con is considered a genius in the coaching ranks. Um, and there was something uh, um, that he, uh, that he talks about that his, he has his assistant coaches do that I had never heard of. I never knew that uh, um, um, football coaches did this. Um, uh, but as, as far as I know, he's the only one that has his coaches do this. And here's what that is. Um, it's called padding games and i'll write that in the description box padding games all right and so this is what it basically is his assistants are required to watch tape of a given of any game and listen to this this is the crazy part on every single play they have to draw on a sheet of paper the offense and the defense not only that they have to map out the movement of each player um, on the field. Um, and they're asked to note everything from tendencies, splits, protections, and any deeper observations. So let me kind of show you what that might look like. Um, so here is one play. So having to map out everything that, that's supposed to happen on this type of play 
everything that did happen, um, some observations you made. And listen, there for, for on a football game, you know, there can be well over 100 plays. Uh, and so uh, his assistants say that it takes um, up, up to eight hours, sometimes a few days to go through one game. And they have to do four or five games. Um, and here's what happens when you do stuff like that. And I'm going to bring it back to music um, in a second. So, so stick with me. Um, even, though, even, though, even those that aren't a Patriots fan, I'm not a Patriots fan, but um, I definitely respect what they're doing. I see Sam's on Patriot Nation, <laughs> Massachusetts. I hear you. All right. Um, um, and so they all said doing this helped them learn the game in a way that they'd never learned it. Now, these are got coaches in the NFL, which is the highest league for our football. And these coaches are saying, I learned things I never knew by doing, going through this process. Um, but not only that, they got to learn the way the coaches thought. And so they could predict and uh, get inside their head and understand what they're thinking in every single moment. Now, this blew my mind because this is the same thing I do as a musician when I'm listening to other mu musicians. Um, we call it transcribing, um, but it's more than just knowing, learning the notes, right? Um, that's, you're figuring out what's my play, you know, you know, if I play, and you could figure out I play the F and, and get there and, and it'd be cool. But not only figure out what was played, but why did the did someone play this? How did they how did they manage to do this? And so um, this is exactly what I've done um, to grow as a musician to get from being a really um, a really poor musician to to improving to to where I am now. I've studied. Uh, what other musicians have done, have done not just the notes, but why they did it. And so I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a clip of Kevin Bond. And I'll write his name in the description box. If you don't know who Kevin Bond is, he, he um, started the whole West Coast sound in gospel. He is like the originator. He is... Um, so guys like Jason White, Mike Burrell, um, they come from kind of the Kevin Bond lineage, that West Coast sound. You know, Kevin Bond is a, is a monster. He, I think he was playing with the Hawkins at like 15. Uh, uh, he, of course, he played with Donna Lawrence and Tri and the Tri City Singers. If you're a if you in this is gospel music, uh, for the, if if you don't know, and um, he did like every album. Uh, of like the 90s and 2000s. It, was, it seemed like every album he was the guy putting it out. He's also called the Million Dollar Producer because he, he's produced so much. Um, but he is kind of like the godfather of, of gospel piano playing. He is an unbelievable musician. And so what I want to do is just play a little clip of him and then I'm going to come back and just take just a small segment and show you just just uh, uh, this clip is actually like two and a half minutes but I'm, I'm only going to work on the first seven seconds and show you how much information you can pull out of a clip and how it can transform uh, your playing for the better so here is the clip of Kevin Bond
Okay. All right. So that's enough <laughs> of that clip. <laughs> um, now, as you can see, Kevin Bond is uh, phenomenal. Um, wait, could y'all could you all hear that clip? Let me know if you if you couldn't hear it. Um, so please type yes if you could hear it, or no you couldn't hear it. Let me know. Um, but Kevin Bond uh, is unreal. And so if you don't know what that song was that he was playing, uh, that song is called "Pass Me Not." It's an old hymn of the church. Um, and so what we're going to do is we are going to um, break down just the first seven seconds or so and see how much information we can pull out. So tell you what, I'm, let me play it one more time and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna play the first few seconds and then, and then we're gonna pull out what we can. So one more time, here's Kevin Bond. Okay, so, all right, so again, that song is called Pass Me Not, it's a hymn of the church, and I actually created a lead sheet for it, um, so you can see it there, and I will tell you what, I will put a link to this in the, in the chat, so if you want to grab this lead sheet, um, now I'm, I'm doing it a different way today, it's free, you just have to, log if, you're, if you're a member of my site already, if you purchase something from us, then you just log in, and, and you'll get the download you'll see it um if not you just create a login and you'll get the uh the lead sheet it's free um so that's the link right there in case you want to grab that lead sheet so it's going to be a little different than it was last week um but definitely grab that lead sheet um, because you might want to go ahead and work on this song and i'll i'll try to put a link to this song as well uh, in the description box so you can grab this all right so let's look at Pass Me Not. Um, this is an old hymn of the church. Um, and so Pass Me Not, if we, if we look at the sheet, uh, the lead sheet right there. Um, so it's simply... So that's like super simple, kind of basically played. But that's not what Kevin Bond did. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through uh, at least four or five different areas of things he did to make this song uh, different. So we know what's what was supposed to happen. We, here's, I, I've given you the lead sheet, so that's what's supposed to happen, right? And now we're going to... Uh, see what he actually did and why he did it so this is kind of like padding the game right so we're like we're analyzing this we're gonna analyze this and see what he did all right so here we go let's begin all right the first thing was uh the song started off with the So something along those lines, right? So let's kind of go through slowly and look at the chords. And I'm going to write the chord names on the screen for you. So let me switch the views so you can see. All right, so hopefully you can see this. All right, cool, you can see that. All right. All right, so the song changes go F, then B flat, 
then F, and then we get to our C7. So that's the norm normal way the song goes, right? So let's look at what Kevin Bond did. First, he did this chord. All right, and so I will talk, go back and talk about these chords in, in, in some detail, but this is just an F, F2, or F add 2. So that's, what, that's the same as F for our purposes now. So he, he played the first chord of the song, but then, then he went here. Now what is this? Does anybody know what this chord is? What is this chord? So we came from here, and then here. Anybody? What is this chord? Anybody know? All right, so again, what is this chord? Anybody? No guesses? Okay, so let's talk about it. Well, you see the E flat in here, and we're, we're in the key of F. Um, Alright, so you see an E flat. Alright, so I have one guess, A7 sharp 5. Alright, so Gaston, nice try. Um, sh sharp 4. Um, so A7 sharp 4 would have a C sharp, D sharp, and G. But what chords did we play here? Uh, we have a D, a D, and E flat. So this E flat kind of, kind, kind of gives it away if you're unsure. So in the key of F, if we have this E flat, nine times out of ten, it's probably an F7 or something related to the F7. And, um, aha, in your key, yeah. And so we have the 13 here. So this is a F7 add 13. Or we could, and I'll write what it is here in the chat. There you go, Eric. Nicely done. So now we've added a F7 chord here. And I'll put this in a different color on the screen. All right, so we go. Um, right, then we go. Um, and this is just B flat major. We have a major seven and nine, so um, B major seven at nine, right? And then he moves it to follow the melody. So now we're here. So we have B major six, B flat major six to nine. So we're on B flat. So that's cool. All right. So cool deal. So cool. We're we're tracking along with the song. So far, we've only added one chord. We went from F to F7 to B flat. So we're cool. Now, here's where the issue comes in, where things change. He goes. So let me, let me show it to you again. So. Sorry. All right, I play it one more time. <laughs> right all right so what how did he get this so I understand that but then he goes he goes to B this kind of shell voicing here B and A what is this what is this how did he, how did he do this does anybody know All right, and so this is the process you have to d um, go through when you're padding a song. You have to ask why things happen. Um, and the truth of the matter is, um, uh, you know, even if you get the answer wrong, it's okay. Try to answer the question. Um, so why, what is this? Why did he do this? So 
Mr. Herbert says dominant. Is it? Diminished. B7. Okay. So when we're trying to figure out stuff, one of the places I always look is the destination. Um, um, where are we going? So he goes... So, yeah, passing move to the three. Nice, nicely done. Um, so let's, let's see what it is. And that's our three. All right, so there's a lot happening here. So let's kind of break this down. All right, so the first thing. So this first thing hits. So this is just a chromatic uh, I'm leading into. But this, this is where we're headed. So let's, let me write this on the screen so you can see this. So instead of, um, so we're still trying to figure out this pass to get here, but we know we land on A, and, let, and while we're on the A, let's figure out what the A is, just 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 f for fun. Uh, so, all right, what is this? So it's A. Now, what is this chord? Does anybody know? <laughs> this is one of the most common gospel chords out. Like everyone needs needs to know what this chord is. Uh, for any all things gospel, music, what is this chord? So this chord is A7, sharp 9, sharp 5. So A7, sharp 9, sharp 5. How do we know it's... So Eric says A7, flat 13, sharp 9. Close. The flat 13 and sharp 5 are actually uh, the same note. But why is it sharp 5? Because there is no 5 in here. There's no E in this chord. And so it becomes sharp 5. All right, so again. All right. So we know, know we're headed to an A7 sharp 9 sharp 5. But what is... What is this pass? So we know... And I'm going to come down here with it. We know the first thing is a B something. And then we know the next thing is a B flat something. Right? All right. Now, question. What is the most popular or widely used progression um, in all of Western music. Does anybody know? So what is the most widely used progression? Uh, Vuyi has it from Russia. The 251. The 251. So... Let's look for a second. If I was going to an A anything, and I wanted to do a 2 five, 1 so this is my 1. Let's pretend this is my 1. The 2 would be B, and the 5 would be E. Right? So let's say, um, in this case, A, and normally in the key of F, A is minor. So I'm, I'm going to call this A minor for now. Right? So the E is going to be dominant. We'll say E7. And the B would be half diminished. So let me erase it and move it a little farther away. We have some room. So it would be B minor 7 flat 5. Right? Now look what we have here. We have a B. And we have an A. But this B flat 
where did that come from? Well, this is just a tritone substitution. Does everybody rem uh, remember what a tritone substitution is? I talked about this. Um, that's it, Gaston. I talked about this in my nine passing chords video. So if you haven't, I'll write that in the chat. Nine passing chords video. Um, um, so if you haven't seen that, definitely check that out because I talk about tritone substitutions in that video, right? So all we basically done is done a two five one, but tritone subbed out the E seven for B flat seven. I'm going to this A now. So wow, Kevin Bond, and, and we're just we're just at like the third, fourth second. We haven't gone much into the song, <laughs> and so for a two and a half minute clip, you can imagine how much material there is to cover. Um, so we have. All right. So let me erase this stuff. And so we see um, now he did not fill in the chords on this B and B, you know. We got this passing. And we'll be up on this one, it is B flat 7 because the melody note is on D and it just works out. But this one, uh oh. But the first chord. We're going to assume it's B minor 7 flat 5. All right. That's right, Nate. It's a tritone substitution. So, all right. So does everybody kind of see how I got that so far? And I'm trying to think through these processes. Why? I'm asking the question. I'm asking the question. How did, how, how did you get that? So this is the tritone sub substitution instead of E he played B flat 7 now after the A7 what happens so what is this D minor to G7 to C so so we have D minor I'll, I'll put it here, D minor. So after the A7, we have D minor 7 to G7. That leads us into C7. So this is just another 2, 5, 1. 2, 5, and then there's our 1 up there. So wow. So let me rewrite this so it looks a little cleaner on the screen. So I'm going to write it on its own line. So this is our 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 song, but this is but let's see what actually Kevin Bond what he what he actually played. He played you know F um, F major um, at F at two. Then he went to F seven at the thirteen. B flat, then he went B half diminished, or B minus half flat 5, to B flat 7, to A7, <laughs> uh, I'm running out of room, I can't even get it all on one line, he added so many chords, A7 sharp 9, sharp 5, I'll just call it altered for now, uh, and then, even though that's not right, and then D minor and G7 to C, seven all right so wow in that short amount of time he took this progression that was simply a, uh, took this simple progression and turned it into <laughs> wow wow so what what can we take away what insights can we take away from this 
I, there's so much in here that we can pull. What insights can we take away from from Kevin in this? What do you think? Now this is interactive, so y'all y'all can talk back and share your ideas. What do you, what do you think? What what is one big takeaway that you've seen? Well, let's let's go back and answer some questions. Um, so let's start with some very basic questions, because there's some guys in here who, or ladies in here, who have only been playing for a short amount of time. Why did he add this F7 in there? Well, he added it in there to propel the chord into B flat. As we know, F7 isn't part of the key of F. And I remember as a as a young musician, like I would see guys, I would say, I know we're in the key of F. But I would see them playing stuff like, and I'm saying, how are they playing the E flat? There's no E flat in the key of F. There's only, I was so confused um, until I understood that in that moment, they're, they're, they're kind of stepping out of the key of F for a moment. This is called a secondary dominant, right? I'll write that in the chat. Secondary dominant. And I talked about this in the nine passing chords video. <laughs> so a lot of this I've actually talked about. Um, so you, uh, if you don't know um, about these ideas, check that video out because I cover most of all of these actually. Um, and so, yeah, the secondary dominant idea um, so the dominant that leads us into B flat is F7. So that's where this I can, that's why I can play an F7, even though I'm in the key of F, because I momentarily step out of the key of F and go to the key of B flat for a moment. Right. Okay. Now, let me erase some of this so we can kind of get a better view of how it's laid out. All right. So he did this right here, this B to B flat seven to A seven sharp nine sharp five right here in this space. So why did he substitute A seven for F? Does anyone know why he substituted A seven for F? Why didn't he just do a two five one back to F instead of a two five one to A seven sharp nine sharp five? Well, this is kind of um, like the circle of fifths, and so let me let me show you this. Our ending goal is to get to C seven. So remember, before the C7, he did the D minor 7 and then the G7. So a 2, 5, 1 to get there. All right. What chord will take me to D minor? Yeah, the secondary dominant, A7. So this A7 is going to take me to D minor 7. And then, well, what will get me to A7? Well, let's do this kind of a B minor 7 flat 5 to B flat 7. Uh, David Anderson, mediate. You can think of it like the medi as the, as the uh, immediate substitution, and that's one way to think of it, for sure. Um, but the chord quality goes from major to dominant. Uh, and so I think... A and so that's one way and, and my teacher as my teacher always said this is music theory not music truth so uh, <laughs> uh you could definitely think of it like that but another way to think of it uh, is a long back cycling just a long progression to take us to c so let me play it again um <laughs> Okay, so what can we take from this? Well, this is a common progression in gospel music and really all music where we go from the one chord from F, so in this case, from the one, um, 
from the 1F to the 5, C7. This is a co common move in gospel music. And so we can go, so, you know, so uh, let me show you some common ways to do it in gospel. You know, so you go like F, B flat, F. So you might do a pass like, right? Or, um, B flat, F, right? And we're used to those, G7 to C7. But now we have a longer way, a little more involved, but a little cooler, maybe, you know, um, way to get to C7. Um, and so um, when you're um, studying uh, songs like this and breaking them down, um, take little chunks. So the next time I have a song, um, let's see. I'm trying to think of a song that does that. Um, let's see. Uh, All right, so I tried on I Need Thee. There's a hymn called I Need Thee. So I need thee, oh. All right, and then here we're going to C. So it's on one and we're going to C. So let's try it. There's my A7. D minor to G7. All right, so you see how I kind of threw it in there? Um, so anytime you're going from one to five, this is a move that you can do, right? And so you can pull out little chunks. And listen, we only did seven seconds of this transcription, and, and it, there's so much here. Okay, so that's harmony. But let's talk about some other elements. Let's talk about how he voiced these chords. Because in these first seven seconds, there is so much rich voicing information here um, that you can take and apply to your own playing that it's unbelievable. All right, so the first thing, the first chord, his F major, he played like this. Now those, um, I might have some of my students in my chords galore class, and yeah, we've talked about all these chords. Um, so we have a cluster voicing here. Or you can think of it as a sus2. Right. All right. So this is our uh, F chord, our F major, and then he goes. Now this is very interesting. Notice how much space there is between the melody and the rest of the chord, and he puts the tension here on the bottom. So why is he voicing his chords, like down here in the melody up here, and then even when he plays chords, there's still a lot of space between the melody. Well, I think he wants the melody to stick out and be really in your ear, right? So we have this um, cluster voicing, and then we have a cluster here, and this kind of spread voicing. It's in a, yeah. All right, and then watch this. He goes. So wait a minute. He does fourth voicings for this next part. Right? Over the B flat and D. So we go from cluster, spread, quarto voicing. we have this nice full chord in the middle right with the tension here and then and then we leave that to some stride piano <laughs> like this is unbelievable so in the span of seven seconds and I'll write this in the chat we've done cluster voicings spread voicings chordal voicings um closed position voicing um 
and then even stride piano. Um, this is unbelievable. Now you notice there are some themes that stay throughout the entire piece. The melody is never d doesn't have anything competing with it. Every chord you notice the melody is separated. Here's the melody here. Now here's the melody separated by a fifth. Here's the melody separated by a fourth. A fourth again by itself. And then he came down to give this kind of crunch. And then single notes. Right? So he's he's causing the melody to stand out so much in your ear. Um, so he has nothing competing with it, right? Um, so now this is a cool idea of voicing the melody using fourth voicings. That's a really cool idea because it's not our normal tertiary harmony, um, which is harmony in thirds. So you could have done something like. Or, or you know that that sounds as as, you, as I play it, you know it sounds simple and common, what we're kind of used to hearing. But he did fourth voice on the melody to give it a different sound, which is really really cool, right? Um, then the next thing, this A seven sharp nine sharp five. This is a common chord in gospel. Um, so this is kind of like a block voicing, actually, because you have the melody here and the melody below. Right? Now, he adds a little flavor onto this to make it feel better. He, does, he just doesn't go, but he goes, I'm going to do it in context. You hear that? That gives it a little grease. In gospel, we love gracing off notes. All right. So the, how he voiced it, he had space um, between his melody note and all the rest of the chords, always. And even when he went to single notes, he always had space. Right, and now you you'll notice he let's kind of go a little deeper on it and his chords, really sparse chords, and then when he comes in the middle here, in the middle he gives us density and fullness, and then even when it comes out, so all the dense and fullness is in the middle. But on the, when he's further up the keys, it's a little sparse and spread. So that's something we can take away. Mixing spread, spread voicings and spread out sounds with condensed and uh, really uh, uh, tense sounding sounds. Oh, Warren, what's going on? Everybody, Warren McPherson is in the room. Wow. Hey, Warren. Um, Phenomenal channel, Piano Lessons with Warren. So if, if you're not familiar with him or don't know his channel, um, definitely go check it out. Uh, he has a lot of great material um, um, that you can uh, learn from. Uh, Daquan is here too, Daquan Bowens. Um, Daquan has a tremendous amount of material as well. He's another piano teacher uh, here on YouTube. A phenomenal musician. Um, both are phenomenal musicians and have a ton of material. Daquan's been posting a lot. <laughs> uh, so he has a ton of material. And Warren is, uh, uh, he has unreal amount of material. So definitely go check out both of their channels because both of their channels are phenomenal. All right. So, but anyway, here's this big idea that we're taking from Kevin Bond that we're going to mix spread voices that are sparse with tension and then going back and forth oh man thanks thanks uh warren for the uh for the uh the super chat i really appreciate that i really appreciate that so let me play it again now 
pay attention to how we go from tense to sparse. So listen. <laughs> All right. Do you hear that? Sparse. So let's let's take a couple more ideas from this. See what else we can pull out. Um, let's take one, just one, one small smaller idea, and that is um, rhythm. Now, rhythm to me is the most important element of music. Rhythm is the most important element of music, and um, I love doing this little experiment um, uh, to prove uh, that idea. Um, right notes are not uh, are not the most important element of music. Rhythm is. Um, the ear will forgive bad notes. The ear will not forgive bad rhythms. All right, let me prove it to you. Okay, so I'm going to play just simple blues, and we're in the key of F, so I'll stay in the key of F. And the first blues, I'm going to play all right notes in my right hand, but bad rhythm in my right hand. And then the second time, I'm going to play all wrong notes but great rhythm and see which one you prefer. So here we go. Like that like gets on your nerves, you're like, man, stop. Like, don't do that, right? <laughs> right? But now this watch watch this. I'm gonna try something. I'm gonna try to play my right hand in F sharp and my left hand in F. So my right hand's gonna be in F sharp and my left hand's gonna be in F. So every note I hit is gonna be bad. So watch this. That's weird. You're like, uh, I don't know. But it's cool. I feel the rhythm. And so even though I hit all wrong notes, like all wrong, wrong notes that second time, um, rhythmically it was there. And so your ear is willing to accept uh, those wrong notes, right? Those wrong notes. And so rhythm is such an important consideration. And I find a lot of musicians don't actually analyze rhythm. All right. Now, Kevin Bond is doing something um, really, really interesting. Really, really interesting um, while he's playing this. Um, so again, you know. Do you hear what's happening? So let me ask this question. How many parts to a beat are there? And let's see if, we'll see if, you can, see if we can figure this out together. How many parts How many parts are there in one beat? All right? Anybody, how many parts are there in one beat? That's a weird question. Um, maybe something something you've never considered. Um, but how many parts of the beat are there? Anybody? All right. I know some of you might be thinking, I didn't know there was more than one part of the beat. The beat was just a beat. You hit the beat, 
and that's the beat. Oh, um, but well, contraire, my friend. Uh, it's there's more than one part to the beat. How many parts are there? All right, so I see we need some help. So there are three parts to any beat, and you can you can break it down further. But let's let's just stick here with. So here's our beat. Here's where our beat lands. Aha! Elijah, Alan, both have it right. Three. So here's dead center on the beat. Here is in front. And here is behind. Um, this is the one disadvantage of sheet music. Uh, oh, Michael Jordan. Thank. Oh, wow, that's a cool name. Thank you for the uh, the super chat. I really appreciate um, uh, the gift, man. Uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Um, so there's the center of the beat. There's front of the beat and behind the beat. So that's one of the disadvantages of sheet music. Um, because sheet music can't tell you when someone's playing in front of the beat or behind the beat or dead center on the beat. Um, sheet music can only give you an approximation of what was happening. Um, this is why it's important to always go check the record to see what was actually played because sheet music can't give you that de kind of detailed information. Um, in the jazz world, we, we kind of say sheet music is a suggestion. I mean, it's close, it's an approximation, but it's not exact. Um, so um, I'm going to play it and see if you can hear uh, what part of the beat I'm on when I play this. So listen. What part of the beat was that? I'll do it again. Why are you thinking? Huh. Right. And if you're not, uh, for those that came in, or have come up recently, come in recently, this song is Pass Me Not in the key of F, the classic hymn. Um, kind of played in the jazzy kind of way by Kevin Bond. Alan says behind with a question mark. All right. Listen again. Yeah, um, so Michael Jordan says behind. And you're right, you're both are right. I am behind the beat, right? Um, if I was on the beat. So if I'm on the beat, it's a little, it doesn't have the same feel. So that is the minutia that you have to really been, uh, you have to really study and, and figure out what, what exactly are these guys doing? Why does it sound the way it sounds? Why does it sound better than mine? What are they doing, right? And so this is the same equivalent, uh, as I said, of Bill Belichick as what, we, what he called padding a game, where you're analyzing the music, going really, really in depth to figure out what's happening. So we've talked about, let's see how many areas that we talked about. We've talked about harmony, we talked about rhythm, we talked about voicings and melody. And I think uh, we're right at an hour now. So I think I'm going to stop here um, and just and think. I've spent an hour talking about just seven seconds of a transcription. There was so much information in that seven seconds. And it was a two and a half minute clip. So imagine how much information you can gain and draw if you were to take one, one clip uh, and just study it. Um, I also tell, I always tell myself, if I just learn one new thing a week, that's 52 new things a year that transform my playing, you know? Or if I, I, if I learn two or two or three new things a week, then it multiplies. And by the end of a year, my playing has grown dramatically just by learning these things. So this one transcription alone, just seven seconds, uh, transform my playing, okay? All right. 
Um, so, so that's uh, the, the, the teaching for today. Did you have any questions? All right. Or was everything clear? <laughs> That's a great question. How do we practice consistency in beat placement? By Alan, that's a um, um, great question. All right. Um, let me answer Elijah's first, then I'll come back to yours, Alan. Al Elijah says, how do you hear the exact notes and chords? Um, so there are a lot of things you can do. Um, um, there are a lot of things you can do to hear the chords. And um, um, let me just do a quick plug for uh, Warren's channel. Warren did a collab with Sean Wilson, who has a transcription um, kind of YouTube channel. And they, they kind of address these questions like, how do you hear? So I definitely encourage you to go to Warren's channel and check out that video. Um, but it, the first thing you want to start with is the melody, because that's oftentimes the easiest to hear. Um, um, that's actually a big question, Elijah. So start with the melody. Um, think about the chords themselves, or the chords that you know there sh should be, and that's kind of a hint, a clue towards hearing it. Uh, for me, I, I listen to the outside voices, the bass and the melody. Sorry, so bass and melody, these are the two that are easiest to hear. And then getting the inside is a little becomes easier when I have the uh, bass and melody. Um, so that's a short answer, but it's so much more than that. And Sean and Warren did a great job uh, addressing that. And it, you know, f for me to address it, 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 it would take, I, I need about 20 minutes. <laughs> and I promise I wouldn't keep you here all night. <laughs> all right, so let me get back to Alan's question. How do we practice consistency in beat placement? Um, well, the first thing I would say is, can you play on the beat, dead on the beat, in time? And so th um, I would grab a metronome and, and see if I'm playing directly on the beat. So w try exercise and see, so I can do something like... <laughs> And I would record myself and see, am I directly on the beat? Where am I first? Um, and then I'm going to then start trying to be on the back end of a beat. So st start trying to miss the metronome like just a little after. So, so, so you can hear that, you hear that tap. Just a little bit behind, right? And then see if you can get ahead of the beat. Um, start slowly. And make sure you record yourself and listen to it. And then start playing progressions and see if you're behind the beat or in front of the beat or dead on the beat. So that would be my suggestion to you. Um, let's see. Who else has a question? Need private lessons. Okay. Um, um, so, Karen, um, here is my private lesson sign-up page. Um, you can definitely uh, sign up on a, um, using that link, and, and, and we can do as many lessons um, as you want. Alan, another great question. Who usually establishes the beat in the band? Well, define what you mean by beat. You mean how you play the beat? Um, um, it depends. Sometimes, the, you know, so for instance, if the keyboardist is the only interest instrument, then, you know, you're kind of playing dead on the beat. You don't want to mess around with the beat to throw off the singers if it's just you. But you have a drummer who's playing on the beat, that might give you freedom to be off the beat. Now, sometimes the drummer will play off the beat. And, th and so you might play on the beat, or you might play off the beat with them. 
Um, and there are lots of guys. Um, um, Jay Dilla has this uh, uh, this sound that kind of influenced and changed the game for beats and where they land. Um, um, and so, um, who establishes it um, depends on, 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 on the song, for sure. All right, um, Zakel Mafala says, your channel is transformed by playing in a rock away. God bless you. Please show us the movements are approaching all the chords of the major scale. Okay, let's see if we can do that. All right. Um, easy, fastest way to find the key of a song. Um, let's see. There are a couple of great clues. Uh, generally, th most songs start on one. And so um, I'm listening to where the song starts, one. I'm listening to the melody because um, the melody will give you the key signature, right? So, right? So, right? So that gives me the key signature, like, oh, I'm in the key of F. So even if I didn't hear the anything else, I just heard the melody, it's giving me the key of F. So that helps. All right. Um, Gaston asked, technique for playing jazz swing. Oh, I, I, you know, I have a video for you. Let me find it for you really quickly. Um, that I think will help you. Um, I did this, feel, here it is. How I is called it the the real secret or a secret to authentic improvisation the way to really make it swing or make it sound like that so check this video out all right any other questions remember if you wanted that lead sheet I have it here it's free um, so I'll put a link to that um, it's free just kind of uh, you put your name and email in if you're not already a member of my site have purchased anything just put your name and email address in and um, it'll take you right to the page. All right, so are there any other questions, y'all? Yes, no. There's a look, there's about a 15 second delay. Uh, so uh, you might see me waiting in silence. All right. So Mr. Kale says, how to practice pentatonic scale efficiently and implementing it in gospel music? Ah, that's a great question. All right, so um, in, in my video, three scales every musician should know. Um, one of the scales I talk about is the pentatonic scale. And I give um, um, some ways to practice practice that scale. So let me let me give you the link here so you have that. Alright, so definitely check that out. How can I apply the bebop scale? Oh that's a huge topic, uh Gaston. Um that's a really really big topic. Um, and so that's something I actually cover in our improvisation course in our online school because it's a, such a huge topic um, and I'm actually working on something really really big that will cover that in even more greater detail so stay tuned to the channel alright you're welcome Mr. Kells and so, uh, don't, please don't forget my request Corey um, yeah so we might see um, what I can do but Zakel, I would encourage you to watch the non-passing course video um, because the approach to any to all the scales degrees is is the same. Um, so definitely check this video out, like uh, Zakeli, um, for sure. Um, um, because for instance, one one is major, right? So how do we approach that? You know, either dominant or whatever, or diminish or two is minor and we approach it a particular way three is minor so we approach we can do the same things we did on two we can do on three so if you know uh two five one to two 
then it's the same idea on um, you know to three four is major so same thing you did to one you do to four and five is dominant so you can do kind of similar stuff D the six is minor so you do the same thing two five one um, and the seventh is diminished, so you can uh, you maybe okay. Any other questions, y'all? Mm. All right. Uh, hi, Cor. I like your way of playing hymns. Ah, <laughs> uh, thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that, John. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, um, we've been at it for an hour and 11 minutes. Um, so if there are no other questions, listen, I will see you here next Wednesday um, at 9.30 Eastern Time live. Uh, make sure you share. Uh, when I put the post the link to the live stream, make sure you share it uh, with your friends, uh, social media, and try to uh, like it, you know, boost it, um, because we want as many musicians as possible to be able to access these. Um, so Kelly says, wow, thank you, all the way from South Africa. Wow, thank you so much for being on. Like, we've literally had people from literally around the world, from Moscow, Russia, to South Africa, um, all across the United States, Brazil. Um, yes, every Wednesday at 9.30 Eastern time um, um, at night. Argentina, um, Zambia, Uganda. Uh, just I'm honored that you all would stay on with me. So I appreciate you all. Um, so if there's nothing else, <laughs> thank you all so much. And so until the next one, be blessed and happy practicing.